So I'm an iOS engineer who mostly worked on building mobile developer tools over the last few years. And more recently, I also got into privacy work on iOS, privacy and security. And the last few months have been crazy in particular. One thing I did is I actually looked into what some of these in-app browsers do on mobile apps. And the whole project kind of exploded. So today I want to share some of the things that I've learned because I took multiple approaches here and how you can apply some of these things to your own project. Initially, when I published my work, I was kind of expecting it to be interesting for the developer community and maybe for Apple, like the platform powering all the apps in this case, um, so that Apple can resolve it and the community itself is interested. But what happened was actually very differently. It kind of exploded and went into mainstream media. So it has escaped my Twitter bubble and like my blog and it gone into all these uh, like all the way to New York Times, national TV in the US, even US Congress and the Australian Minister of Defense, uh, which at some point got a little scary. <laughs> and so today I want to share a little bit of how all of this happened and also like how we as developers can kind of like help shape the platform that we are working on for the better. So let's first talk about just the rough timeline and how it all happened, and then also on the impact that those things uh, have on the platform that we work on. So for this project in particular, let's briefly talk about what are in-app browsers. So initially, social media apps have built in-app browsers. So back when, whenever you click on a link, it would go to this default browser in a separate app. And social media apps never liked that because it, people, it would reduce engagement and people would forget to come back to the social media app. So they built this in-app browser, which back then was fine. And very quickly, Apple actually reacted and built a so-called SF Safari view controller, which is a component you can add to your application. It's using the regular Safari, powered by Safari, by your own plugins and settings you have set up. And you can still you still have everything inside the application. You have all the benefits, and as well, it also uh, helps protect the user's privacy. All of this is running its own thread. You have the configuration, you have your password manager, and so on. So you would think by now, this was many, many years ago, so by now you would think that all the apps are, s are already using it. And yes, the majority of apps use Apple's recommended approach here. Um, also, side notice, I mostly talk about Apple here just because that's my area of expertise, but Android is actually kind of similar. They also have the similar technology here. So you would think all these apps are using SF Safari View Controller now. Um, it adds more convenience to the user, it protects the user's privacy, uh, and doesn't really have any disadvantages. But Instagram was still opening everything in their in-app browser, and I was annoyed about that, so I actually blogged about this four years ago. So I published a blog, a, a blog post, I published a tweet uh, about how bad in-app browsers are and how risky they are. But it never took off, like nobody really cared. And so this time I wanted to do it differently. First I needed to see if Instagram is actually running any JavaScript code. And so I built a little website that had some honeypots in it, so basically just overriding the JavaScript functions that are out there and seeing if they are being called. And within a few minutes, I got the first results. So turns out, document.getElementById is called somewhere. And this is great that we are in this big room, as you can actually read everything, probably. Um, I did not expect this. <laughs> so uh, as soon as I saw this method was being called, I knew something sketchy might be going on here. So I built out a test website and overrode more of the JavaScript functions to see what else is being called. And so. I found out that the Instagram app actually injects an external JavaScript file into all websites they show that includes 480 lines of code and can be changed remotely by Meta at any time. At any time. And they do that on every single third-party website that is being shown in their in-app browser. So because this is a tech talk, I want to talk about the technical details here. It's very trivial. It's really just building a dummy website, implementing some JavaScript code, overriding document get element by ID by a function, and then I would print out the code that was being run, print out the parameter, and that's it. And that was all that was needed here. So the first thing I did when I found out is I started writing a blog post. And so I wrote the rough version of the blog post even before I told Meta about this issue. Um, it's always a good investment to already write a rough post because no matter the outcome of this whole situation, you, you can use it. So if they come back to you and say like, oh, thanks for reporting this issue, we have resolved this now, you can still publish it and add a note at the very top that's like, uh, after you disclosed the issue, this was being resolved. 
If they're not responding, then you definitely want that blog post to be ready. So this is all about responsible disclosure. So once I had the very first version of the blog post ready, I disclosed the issue with Meta. Uh, obviously, this is not something that happened by mistake by Meta, like they were actively injecting code, but I was still wanted to disclose it through their bug bounty program. So at this point in time, I was already able to attach a PDF copy of my article uh, describing the issue at full length. So I didn't have to do any extra work here. And within less than a day, they confirmed the findings. They confirmed that they told the right team to look into this and that um, they gave me updates every few, week that every few weeks that they're still looking into it. And I get it, it's a big company. There's a lot of teams involved. It's not that easy. But around two months, I gave them my final chance to reply because I always just heard back, we're still looking into this. So I gave them a date and a time at which I'm going to go public unless they give me a proper update. Uh, they didn't respond anymore, so at this time, uh, at this point in time, they were still injecting that script into all these websites. So the time came, I published a tweet, it has reached like 17 million impressions, um, tons of replies, the press coverage, and you can be certain that within a year, in-app browsers will look very differently. Because now there is so much pressure towards Apple, Google, and even Meta, that there needs to be changes in our platform. And this went all the way to multiple lawsuits happening against Meta, so there might even be legal consequences here. What was interesting here was, in this scenario, was the pushback by Meta, the company that runs Instagram and Facebook. Immediately after my post went viral, they made a statement to the press that my findings are incorrect and misleading. So I had a I had heart attack. <laughs> I was like, wait, did I, did I make a mistake? Like, are my findings actually correct? Like, Meta wouldn't just say something like this if it wasn't true, right? So I, I was really scared. What if I made a mistake? I went viral on something that isn't actually true, and I was like talking badly about Instagram. So suddenly, they, they communicated all that through press. So suddenly, the press was actually asking me for a statement. and like, hey, Meta says your reports are incorrect and misleading. What do you have to say to that? So you can imagine me just working from home and one of the largest tech companies in the world uh, telling me, yeah, my, my findings are incorrect. Um, so I very quickly stopped responding because it ended up being a back and forth. We were talking about different things partly. And so I decided to do what we engineers often do, which is find proof and publish it. So instead of my words against meta words, I decided to publish the website that prints out all the JavaScript commands. It's called innerbrowser.com. You can just send it to yourself through like an Instagram DM, for example. And then you can see for yourself what is actually happening. And so in here, I'm also highlighting some of the things that are happening. So you can see there is uh, the actual code and then some comments. And it's also highlighted in red if I consider it as dangerous. And then sometimes there are some things that are pretty harmless. For example, uh, a lot of in-app browsers show the title at the very top. So querying the title from a website is relatively harmless. It's a read-only uh, operation here. So at the same time as publishing this page, I also published a full list of the most used, uh, a full list of the most popular apps and their use of browser technology. And one app that stood out the most here was actually TikTok, because they actually inject excessive monitoring of various JavaScript events even including a keylogger. So my project didn't look into if the data is being used or how it is being used, so I want to be very clear here. I only looked into the JavaScript code that was set up. So in this case, there was JavaScript code in place, um, and still is, that is monitoring, uh, is able to monitor keystrokes on all these websites. So you know what happened with Meta after I published in a browser.com, this little website? Meta stayed quiet. They didn't comment on this issue anymore. There was no more back and forth. So now I'm going to talk about a few other privacy projects that I worked on a few years ago. And I want to mention here that this is not to like just showcase the projects, but to show you some of these angles you can take on taking something that's seemingly very harmless or very small and actually cause significant damage, potentially cause significant damage, in theory, with those things. So first off, back in 2017, I was playing around with the Photos SDK on the iPhone for the first time. And I was looking into a way to render an image at the right resolution. While I did that, I noticed the GPS information is attached to the photo, right? I mean, we all know that the EXIF data, like even uh, regular users know nowadays that photos have the location attached because all the photos apps have a map. So my first thought was, OK, what if I have an app that does not have location access? How about, but I do have access to photos. How about I get the most recent photo 
see how long ago that was, get the location, and I can probably estimate where the user is at that moment. That quickly led to, why only one photo? Let's get all of them and query through them. So the scary piece here is that you can see that at the very top, uh, very bottom, it takes only half a second to go through 10,000 photos and their location, which is insane. So you can always do it in the background without anyone noticing. So when you have access to 10,000 locations, you get a very good insight of the user's life, as in where they work, where they live, where they travel to, how often they travel, what kind of life they have in general. So having published this, and actually published this to the App Store back then, Apple has resolved that very quickly, introducing a more fine-grained control over the permission system for photos. Similarly, camera permissions, you know on the MacBook you have this little green LED that indicates whenever the camera is active. So the iPhone didn't have that, at least many years ago, because it was always clear that whenever you use the camera, you would already see the camera, right? There's no way to record you in the background. Well, that wasn't true. It just nobody did that. So a friend of mine pointed out that you can actually access the camera after you have permission once and not show what is being recorded at that moment. So I built this little dummy app, which is a social media app. You can see I'm posting a photo, so I gave permission for the camera. And so I posted a photo on the social media app, and now I'm scrolling through the feed. And as I'm doing this, suddenly I see myself using that social media app. Um, and so <laughs> uh, you can then use that data, use those photos, and run it through some basic image recognition, for example, as in how many people are using the phone, who is using the phone, and how do you currently look? Are you looking bored? Are you looking happy? So you can see here that I was doing some very basic facial recognition that's built into the iOS nowadays to yeah, highlight facial features. And so, yeah, this is, this is obviously super scary. Um, so whenever the app is running, you, was ac you were actually able to record uh, both cameras at any time. And also I want to point out that the red bar at the top is not a camera indicator. That was me recording the screen. There was actually no indication at all. And as you can imagine, within like a year or so, Apple has resolved this. So now we all have these green and orange uh, LEDs on iPhone. It's soft LEDs, but it's still something. Very small project, also very harmless, but also really bad, is back in the days, you may remember, the iPhone was always asking you for your Apple ID password at super random times. There was no pattern. And no matter if you use an app, if you're on a home screen or somewhere else. So how difficult is it to replicate this alert? Very easy. It took less than three minutes, I believe. And so I tweeted that. Tweet went very viral, and Apple has fixed this. There is no more random pop-ups like this. The next one was about macOS. Uh, screen permissions. So for those of you who use 1Password, you know 1Password has uh, support for two-factor authentication. So you need to scan a QR code. The problem is that the QR code is shown on your computer. So how do you scan it? So 1Password built this thing where you could get a small window and you can drag it over the QR code and it will parse it and then use that for two-factor. When I first saw it, it was like, wait, how, how, how the hell does 1Password just read the QR code from screen? So it's a sandbox application. You should not be able to do that. So I looked through how to access the screen as a Mac app. Turns out it's a single line of code. There's no permission. There's no checks, nothing. So I built this little thing that would take screenshots at random time and then run it through OCR and recognize things that are happening. So over here, you can see like a GitHub API token or username and password being leaked. This is also resolved now. Now I thought, OK, how do we make this even bigger? <laughs> so uh, I was looking into if you can take the knowledge from one of the previous projects and apply it on a larger scale. And one of the best things you can do is inject code into other applications so you have an even bigger attack surface. So I looked into how I can apply some very basic human in the middle, man in the middle network attacks on unencrypted connections. And so I was looking at the most used iOS SDKs at the time and 31% were vulnerable to some very basic human in the middle attacks, including Amazon's AWS SDK, for example. So I was able to inject malicious code into those apps through the SDKs if I am in the same network uh, as the other developer, like it is the case at a conference, at an airport, at a hotel, and so on. So one SDK that stood out the most was BuddyBuild. BuddyBuild back then told users to run a curl command and pipe it over to SH, which is very bad already. But they thought it looks nice if it doesn't have HTTPS. 
in front of the URL, right? It looks cleaner, but that means that the request is not encrypted and you can actually do something really bad. Okay, when I saw this, I was really excited. I was like, okay, what is the first thing you can do here? So I figured it's a developer's machine, so this is worth a lot because it runs and has access to your code. So I was looking into this. So I, f I found a way to basically take over the whole machine, installing a keylogger, enabling SSH, uh, remote access, screen sharing, and file system access. So you can see this in action now. So you are a user, copy and pasting, uh, pasting that. And so you have two windows here. Attacker is a Raspberry Pi that's in the same network. And user is the user just running BuddyBuild, the BuddyBuild installer. And so within a very, within a few seconds, the attacker suddenly sees all the keystrokes that are happening in real time. So you can easily get the password as well. Um, and it also enabled the, it also enabled uh, remote SSH access. So you can see how the Raspberry Pi now logs into that machine and now has full file system access. Again, this only took a few seconds to do. And then, uh, what it's showing now is actually showed a modified script. So it's original body build script. And then in between, I even added some comments on like, this is the hacked code, I believe. Malicious code. <laughs> so in between the code that body build is actually running, um, it's now doing the keylogger setup. So whenever I published any of these projects, the very first responses I always got was this. Yeah, obviously. So obviously when you give an app camera permission, they have access to your cameras when your app is running, right? Obviously, if you have access to images, you have access to location. It's always been like this, photos have GPS attached. But those comments are actually quite useless because first off, it's not clear for the majority of users and the situation is way more complicated than this. And I think we sometimes forget this. So for example, if you use any ride sharing app, chances are you've uploaded a profile picture. To upload a profile picture, you need to either give it access to your camera or your photos, right? So <laughs> no matter what you choose, there is one of the projects I was shown before. You could have used either you could get the historic location information, which I'm sure is very useful for a ride sharing app, or you can always get camera access whenever the ride sharing app is used. Also, you can assume, you can already guess how many people would upload a profile picture, then go to the settings screen and manually revoke the permission after they've uploaded the picture. Not a lot of people do that. So another thing you hear a lot is like, just don't use the app. And that's again very simplified because quite often you don't actually have a very easy, like a choice to use whatever you wanna use. Like for example, your company might require you to use certain apps, use sport clubs, use car maker and so on. And in general, it's often a pretty big privilege to be able to just switch to another app. And sometimes it's really not possible. So it's our job as developers to uh, protect the user. However, us as individual developers have a hard time helping all the users. We usually only have the scope of making our app better as in, you know, respecting the user's privacy. So even if we're doing 100% correctly, a competitor app might not do the same thing. And sometimes you might even get pressure from your own company to like show less permission pop-ups or be faster with the stuff you do. So that's a really tricky thing to balance. So the best way to really have a big impact is to help design and improve the underlying platform. So if, even if a company is doing, even if a company isn't doing anything malicious, you actually don't know if any of these SDKs they have included uh, might do some shady app tracking. And one of the main problems here is that many of the companies that collect all this data aren't actually chosen by the user, right? It's, it's chosen by the company building the app. And some, many times these data companies, they don't actually have a public name. So they don't really have a name to, lo uh, name to lose here. So um, basically, I, I really believe that everyone working on any platform, and we all do, already knows of some things that could be improved or that could be abused. So it's really just about taking that new angle. So be it a permission system, be it technology, SDK, API, you name it. So once you found something, again, something that seems very harmless. Think about the worst case that could happen. And then think about how could a bad actor cause the highest amount of damage. And so it's our job to actually take that and wrap it nicely to show the magnitude of the issue. This is also really important because why you do that, like packaging it up or building a prototype, 
you can see if you write if you overestimate or underestimate the damage that you can cause with this problem. So the worst case scenario is actually if the worst case scenario is actually pretty bad, it's time to build a prototype. So build the most basic version. Like if I'm really dumb, you saw the source code of my page. Like it's very simple but sh build something that showcases the issue requiring as little work as possible. And once you have that, you have proof that this is actually a problem. So after having the prototype, you should also submit the issue to the affected platform, as mentioned before, as part of the responsible disclosure. Because depending on the severity, the large companies actually go through your reports within usually like within one day or less. Um, Many issues you might find aren't super critical. So many companies, they actually have very strict requirements on what qualifies, especially for a paid bug bounty program. So in my case, actually, none of the privacy projects ever were like considered as part of the bug bounty program. So uh, it's still very important to give this company a heads up, though, because it might be a mistake that they've been doing. They might want to respond. They might want to give you a statement. And then depending on what the response was, you can decide how you want to proceed. So how to go public? Assuming you gave the company a heads up and assuming the thing you found doesn't cause significant damage to the users or other people, um, it's time to educate the public for this. So you already did all the hard work of building the prototype and building the art, like writing the blog post. So now it's time to go live with it. So this could be posting on your blog, posting on Twitter, maybe making a tweet storm. And if everything works out and the community believes this is valuable, you will get enough retweets, engagement, replies to actually have a critical reach for that. But if it's your first time doing it, it might be tricky to get that first piece. So it's actually really useful to reach out to somebody who has done that before. Um, this could be just sending an email or a Twitter DM to somebody who has done that. So with that, always feel free to send me anything if you want feedback or if I can help with anything in that space. But also, don't forget websites like Hacker News, for example, that don't require existing followers. So on Hacker News, I think it's a good example. A lot of people hate it, a lot of people love it, whatever. But what is nice is that if you write good content or write something interesting, it doesn't matter how many followers you have. Like you have a um, rather equal playing field compared to Twitter. So if you didn't get a response from the affected party, or maybe just a very generic reply, like don't get discouraged. You have to really think about how these large companies, like for example, Apple, uh, uh, sorry, Apple work. So they have a lot of work in progress. They have a lot of projects. They have many months and quarters planned ahead of time. So they cannot really just squeeze in a random thing that you tweeted about or blogged about. So they, um, realistically, they just cannot justify doing that. So this is why going public is such an important step here in my experience. Because just imagine being one of the engineers in that team responsible for camera permissions. Realistically, they already know about this, right? I mean, they've built the API and designed the API after all. But they have a lot of things to work on, a lot of shiny things to work on. Um, so just improving privacy a little bit might not be high up on the list. So by them seeing your article on the Hacker News front page, maybe even traditional media, you can see how for the engineer, it would be way easier now to walk up to the manager or team lead or whatever and say like, hey, like we have this article about the stuff that our team owns, um, not in a good way. Uh, it would actually be very easy to fix that. Like if we can squeeze in one week of work, we could actually improve that. You can see how this is actually very useful for an engineer who is actually passionate about fixing this. And now they have the proof or the data to actually uh, show that. So to wrap things up, it is so important that we all do the things that we believe are right and educate the people around us. So if it's not us investigating and improving those systems, who is? Like there must be some incentive here. So even for example, for in a browser, this issue has been around for so many years. And I don't really have any JavaScript skills or anything around this. And I was still able to like look into this and find something interesting. So I really encourage all of you to use the knowledge you have on whatever platform, API, SDK you work on, and think about potential loopholes or things you can work around. It's actually a really fun and rewarding activity, and you can really help shape the underlying platform. Thank you.